Welcome everyone. This is Peter Chadi, Chairman of Creative University. Welcome to another session of Creative U. And as always, we have a great guest today and her name is Don Chmielewski. I'll introduce her in a second. Uh, but Don is a senior editor for Media, Entertainment and Tech at Forbes, one of the leading business publications out there. And uh, Don is great. And we'll get into what the topic is today, which is the life of a media, entertainment and tech journalist how she got there, what it's like, um, the challenges, the triumphs, and all of that. We'll talk about all that. Don. Hey Peter, how's it going? Good, good to see you, Don. Where are you calling in from? I'm in Southern California, just like you, in okay. lovely Irvine. So. Okay. All right. Well, well, what, home office. Wonderful. We're going to keep it really lively and we're going to go rapid fire today because, like okay. any great journalist, uh, Don is under deadline. <laughs> and so. She, <laughs> This I'm, is I'm coming this, to you. No, I was just going to say that this is your life. It's any moment massive stories can break. And it, this is the new way of the business, really. It's true. You know, the, 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 um, the internet has given us 24 hour news cycles, uh, seven days a week. Uh, and I'm, I'm researching a story now uh, that another publication began to explore. So there is competitive pressure to get a story published yes. as soon as possible. Uh, we shall see if I make my editors happy or if there's another uh, another uh, screen fest in my future. Okay, so <laughs> we're gonna go really rapid fire because we're gonna keep this well under an hour, especially today uh, out of um, respect for her time, for Don's time. But um, I'll give a brief bio, but first, before I do, Don, I always ask uh, my guests, to pick a song, any song that they want to start the session as people are logging in. And there's no rules on that. So I asked Don yesterday what she wanted to, me to play and she picked The Bitch is Back by Elton John. And so Don, why? <laughs> it, uh, it could be my theme song. No, it is, uh, they're, they, you know, like every journalist, I'm uh, mostly nice, but there's some days where I'm not. <laughs> And today I've been up since 3 a.m. So that really does capture my mood. Okay, so there's the life of a journalist for you. But anyhow, just Don has been nothing but delightful in the probably 20 years that I've known Don and um, a really brief background about her and what she's done. So she's an award-winning journalist. She's one of the leading uh, journalists in the world of media and entertainment and tech. No question, hands down. Go to, um, if, if you want scoops, Don is where you find them. She has over 30 Thanks, years of experience covering business, entertainment, and technology. Graduate of Utica College, um, writes, as I said, for Forbes right now, but she's written previously for um, all the major publications, USA Today, US News World Report, Los Angeles Times. Um, she's on TV frequently as a commentator, so CNN, CNBC, uh, NBC, National, NPR. Uh, and then just a couple of quick examples of her great work. As a senior editor at Recode, which is a, a, another leading media tech publication. She won awards for her coverage of the devastating cyber attack on Sony Pictures Entertainment, if you remember a few years back. And then in another very different kind of story, when she worked at the LA Times, she exposed a, ch a child pedophile scandal in Hollywood that resulted in changes to California law that requires background checks for talent agents, managers, and others with unsupervised access to young actors and models. So the full gamut of things. Um, so again, wonderful to have you on board and support, but I'm gonna dig right into it, uh, Don. So really quickly, and then we'll get to the heart of what it's like to be you and the days that you're having today, as an example. The life of a media entertainment journalist, how did you get from your first inspiration of wanting to be a writer slash journalist and into becoming one as your profession? Just take us through that journey. So, you know, like, like everyone who's perhaps listening, um, you know, has been told by their parents to uh, do what you love because uh, that way work won't seem so tedious. It will feel like at least a joy or at least more fulfilling. And, you know, falling into the realm of media reporting was the ultimate expression of my passions. You know, I loved theater and film uh, and television. And I, and I also am intrigued by technology. Uh, I came to entertainment journalism by a slightly circuitous route. I was working as a, as a writer for the San Jose Mercury News, one of the uh, uh, one-time great uh, publication uh, that was really in the vanguard of 
technology coverage in the years before the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times really devoted serious resources to the industry. And I was writing about um, the collisions that were taking place between the first of the file sharing services, Napster, and the music industry. And it became a great and accessible way to talk about changes in technology through, through, a, um, through a medium that, that everyone could relate to. People are passionate about music. And so this is a way to talk about change and to talk about um, evolving forms of distribution and uh, the fundamentals of the industry uh, through something that, that people really have an emotional connection to, music. So that was what began my journey. Um, and it led me to uh, the Los Angeles Times where I wrote about that intersection of tech and entertainment and then off into the dot com, you know, the, the yeah. uh, digital yeah. media world, yeah. uh, working uh, fleetingly for Recode and then working for um, one of the industry trades, which is a, uh, a, a very different velocity. It's a, uh, you know, five to eight story a day kind of gig until yeah. I found, found myself at Forbes about two years ago. Yeah, uh, and that's one thing I want to talk to you about, just the velocity, the pressures that you're under as a journalist all the time and how that's evolved over time. But like I said, Don and I met about 20 years ago, probably when I was at that intersection of music, when I was at Music Match and how tech was transforming, getting into the on-demand streaming game. And um, your, your jumping on or immersing yourself into technology, that how it's transforming media, you were on the early, kind of on the vanguard of doing that. And now the business is fully transformed by technology where we've kind of flipped what it means to be a media and entertainment company. So I want to get into that, um, that your life now. Um, and first, how do you, I'll, I'll start with this, just with this ever changing, like you have today, you have a breaking story of some kind that we'll read about. But all the time, the pace, the velocity of these kind of breaking stories and the pressures you're under to constantly be on it, that's evolved over time, I would imagine. But tell us from your perspective, from the time you began as a journalist to where it is today, how it is today, how the business as a journalist has evolved and your day-to-day -day yeah. lives. I think um, every, everyone's lives have been impacted by sort of this on-demand world that we live in. It is not merely uh, Netflix that's on demand, it's, it's we as humans and as, as uh, people who work in, in the, this industry and in every industry. Uh, when I began uh, my journalism career, I was working for a print publication, actually. I started very early days at a weekly, uh, news, uh, weekly newspaper. It was a community newspaper where there was one deadline a week. And so I had a rather, uh, rather relaxed uh, day. I would come into the office with my coffee and my sandwich or bagel sandwich or some, some breakfast and read the paper and then begin my day. Uh, now, journalist hours tend to be long. So I would write during the day and then cover meetings at, at night. It was small time. It was community journalism. It was writing about the sewer board or the zoning board. It, but it was, uh, it was a real, you know, you get a sense of how journalism can connect communities by writing stories that are relevant to a very local audience. Uh, and it was, it was a habit forming. Uh, it was, it was, uh, it, it's still, even though I was writing about topics that perhaps aren't of interest um, to a larger audience, it was still uh, appealing. Like I, my first major scoop was writing about a, uh, a beaver dam that flooded out the whole, <laughs> whole community, really homespun stuff. Yeah, yeah. My, my days have certainly changed since then. The, you know, as, you know, as, as uh, technology improved and major news publications uh, began publishing online, uh, by the time I, I, I joined the Los Angeles Times in 2006, uh, it was just adapting to, um, to this world of you know, making news of accessible through the internet. And it really hadn't uh, adapted to the metabolism of, metabolism of the internet. So we used to joke it was yesterday's news tomorrow. You know? <laughs> so it was, it was just not, not taking advantage of the inherent nature of the internet, which for, for the first time allowed print publications to compete with its broadcast brethren. Uh, suddenly you could, be, you could be immediate and in the moment and in the conversation in the same way that a, tele a live television broadcast could be say, or a radio, you know, you know, a radio report. Um, so it really, it was uh, both a blessing and a curse. It removed a lot of the advertising that supported the, the, the newspaper world, but it also gave us a much broader audience. Um, so, so as the industry evolved and as the industry began to capitalize on the immediacy of online delivery, that created uh, a sort of uh, 
twitch metabolism that one might find in a sprinter. Um, when news breaks, um, you have to be responsive. And within uh, an hour of a story being published, you either need to advance, you need to advance the conversation in some way, or else you simply disappear into the ether. You're no longer relevant. So, so that requires um, a certain watchfulness, uh, uh, so almost around the clock watchfulness, because I'm always now uh, looking at Twitter or my email, you know, or my text messages or my alerts via uh, other messaging platforms to know when I need to uh, get to my computer and write. Um, and that's also true of a publication like Forbes, which is a venerable business magazine, but it too recognizes the need to be in the conversation and indeed, if you can, to lead the conversation. So how does that just as, you know, your life on a day-to-day -day basis, um, how has that, what has that done to your, your psyche in term and just your day to day life and how you spend your hours because you kind of laid it out a little bit and it sounded like it was a little bit more relaxed in the sense of how you could plan your day. But now, if you're constantly bombarded with news stories and you got to keep up, like what is the pressure? What are the pressures that you feel, if anything, at this point and how, how you view the business and, and how it is on a day to day basis for you and your personal satisfaction compared to what it was and, and you know the kinds of stories you can tell and the amount of time you can put into them. Can you lay that out a little bit. Yeah, it's it's um, it's interesting, uh, you know, back, you know, back in the day when I was a print reporter, I had one way to publish, which was in, in print. Yeah. Uh, and then it was later, you know, published online. Um, and, but now, uh, to be a credible journalist, you need to be act as active on social media as you are on your news organization's publishing platform. And to get to your question, I mean, that there, there is sort of an, an endlessness to the day. Uh, it helps if you are by nature a news junkie, if you're someone who loves to be the first to know of a development in whatever area you happen to be passionate about. I love film and TV and, and music. Um, and sort of the, uh, the, the, uh, Mac, the moves behind the scenes at the corporate level, but whatever it is you're passionate about, um, that'll be essential to sort of sustaining you through uh, what is sort of a constant, um, the constant demands of the news world. You really do have to sort of maintain a presence day and night, um, you know, on your platform and on other social media platforms just to be, um, viewed as relevant uh, and to be viewed as credible. You need to be able to not only publish, but, but to be uh, responsive to the reader um, and to be able to address criticisms of your reporting and to be transparent about your process. Um, because as you know, these organizations are all, ex you know, are all under attack um, for, you know, you know, allegations about our, you know, charges about our credibility, challenges to our credibility. So being, uh, being public in your persona and being accountable for your journalism only only makes only strengthens the work you do. Yeah, and, and I would imagine like okay, just even that part of it, the fact that you're always on essentially, and so you're writing your stories that are probably your you know you're coordinating with others within whatever publication you're in. So let's say at Forbes, but at the same time you're also doing your social media, etc. So you are kind of a a self. You have to keep that mind of what the publication is all about in everything you do, because there's so many different ways that you're engaging with an audience that you have to be very mindful of, of all of that. So it's, it's kind of a different, I would imagine it's back many years ago, it was more collaborative in a sense that, and now there's also, there's collaboration, but there's also a lot of individual, you're, you know, you're doing a journal, you're being a journalist on your own, essentially on behalf, representing an organization. Right, you're right. I mean, it's, um, you know, I, it's been a long while since I worked in a traditional newsroom and I do dearly miss uh, the collegiality and the sort of creative collisions yeah. that happen when you're sitting in a newsroom surrounded by smart, creative people. And usually sparks fly in unexpected ways. Sources appear that one might not have, have considered. You can find help uh, if, if you're on deadline and you're sort of racing against the clock to, to publish something, uh, there, there always are smart people who are willing to pitch in because you have this sort of shared interest in the quality of your publication. Yeah. So I do miss that. But I mean, we live in a virtual world and all of us have had more than a year of working in isolation. And we are, we, you know, technology has given us the benefit of 
of virtual connection. So um, whether it is um, you know Slack to make, maintain constant communications with my colleagues in the newsroom, or um, Signal if I want to have a confidential conversation with my news sources that I don't want um, and, uh, to be traced back. Um, you know, and and um, and so you sort of make you create a community around yourself, and you have to be perhaps more um, more take 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 more of the initiative in in instigating the sorts of collab collaborations that result in a better a better story. Um, but also, like this world has changed so much that storytelling itself has changed. So as as a writer. You, you, you have so many different narrative avenues to explore. And that's such a fabulous gift to, to all of us who write. I know, Peter, you're, you're also a writer. Um, I know you have this platform and you have podcasts. And uh, I've, I've, one, of, uh, one of the stories I've, I've, I've reported on about the uh, rather toxic culture of TikTok uh, gave birth to a documentary film, which was sold to Hulu. So Good for you. Um, yeah, so it's fun, you know? So, so, um, by, by the way, let me ask you about that for a second. Yes. So that story gave birth to a documentary film and I literally was going to mention that story today and I had the physical paper copy in my hands of it because uh -huh. I, I read that story and it was a great story. Do you get, uh, this is a little bit of a sidetrack here, but do you get credit for that? You, you broke the story. There's a Hulu documentary on it. So are you part of that process? Do you get I will compensated be. for uh, it? You know, so we, we, uh, we've had uh, the co-writer and in fact, the lead writer, Abe uh, Brown, on that particular piece, who is our lead uh, report, social media reporter. And I will, will share, uh, you know, have been working with a documentary filmmaker and helping to identify sources and themes. Yeah. Um, and we presumably will be have the opportunity to be on camera to talk about our, our research and uh, what we know about the platform. And hopefully they can find uh, people who will be willing to go on camera to talk, talk about TikTok because, you know, it is obviously transforming our culture. It is, you know, it is, it is uh, really in the zeitgeist and defining the zeitgeist. It's breaking music. So it's a very important social media platform, also the first in the US to be owned in China, which has created some political tensions and uh, you know, some security questions. So it's a really complicated, meaty, interesting topic that is, is meant for a long form exploration through a yeah. documentary. Well, no, that, so that's fascinating. The multi-platformization of the media world as a result of technology has led to all these different platforms for you as an, uh, to have an opportunity to um, you know, to do your craft in multiple ways, but at the same time, because there's so many different platforms, to be able to find the time to be able to do the long form, and I know that you've been writing a book, and right. how you find that time to be able to do that, like, this is a constant challenge for you, and so. I think, I think for ahead. all of us, right? I mean, like, it's, it's, it's all about prioritization, just, you know, in the same way that all of us go about our day and we have this, this device that is like a constant uh, uh -huh. distraction and we, we choose to manage our time and prioritize our time. And so that becomes really important in this world where you have so many competing demands, you have to prioritize, you know, what, so, you know, how should I spend the next couple of hours? Um, you know, do I need to actually see my family, <laughs> spend time with my puppy? You know, they're also, you know, I've also committed to those relationships, so I should probably be engaged in some way, um, you know, or, or do I need uh, quiet time to actually write? Uh, as I'm sure you've discovered too, Peter, you know, every, every writer has a particular sort of golden, uh, golden time. Mine tends to be in the evening when it's quiet and there are fewer distractions. Um, and, uh, and uh, um, hang on, just speaking of fewer distractions, that's my editor. Okay. Uh, yeah, no, not a problem, not a problem. So take take your time here. I'll just I'll just uh, talk a little bit while while you do that. So take your time. So for everybody out there, like this is this is the life. This is the life of a journalist. And as Don said, that I do a fair amount of writing myself. And um, by the way, I have a new podcast that if you like music, it's called Story Behind the Song on Consequence. And first interview just dropped yesterday with Colin Hay of Men at Work. Um, but that's, so that's just an example of different kinds of ways to do it. But anyhow, you're back. So Don, Sorry about that. <laughs> no, 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 listen. And like I said, I'm going to go rapid fire because I know that you're, 
you're under tremendous deadline and I appreciate your time. So do you think that the modern newsroom or the, the newsroom as the way we thought of it, is that dead now because of what has happened with journalism and because there's more of this virtual going on? Um, I think, you know, the, the news, newsroom still exists, right? So some major news outlets still operate in newsroom and indeed even, um, even tiny digital publications have small but mighty newsrooms so you can have a community of writers to be with. Um, but I think that it's, it's, it's um, you know, and in, in, uh, my, my newsroom at Forbes, there are over 100 writers who are all based in a, an office in Jersey City. So I occasionally travel 3,000 miles so that I can be with my people. Uh, yeah, <laughs> so, nice. so newsrooms still exist. Okay. And they're, they're, um, they're truly uh, powerful collaborative places. And I hope they don't disappear. Um, but if, you know, if you need to make your own community, uh, we have so many different ways to do that, you know, online or, you know, by old fashioned phone or actually in person. So, I mean, I, I don't think that they're, they're extinct. I think they're still a valuable part of the process. Uh, in my you know, perfect world, I would be there all the time, but, you know, I, I will have to, to uh, take my pleasures on a limited basis when they're available to me. Yeah. So, okay, let's get into your process a little bit. Now, with all the competitive pressures out there, breaking the stories, getting the more in-depth story, getting the scoop, scoops, it, uh, you know, it's always been critical. But how do you find your stories and how do your you know, scoops come to you? Because you lead the charge in the business. I read a lot of different people who are, in the, who are journalists in the space and you're you know, one of my go-to sources for sure. So how does that happen? So, I mean, it's, it's um, you know, we ha we're fortunate in the world of journalism is we get to meet um, so many interesting people who are doing exciting, intriguing, and in some cases, you know, industry changing things. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so, so a lot of the stories are germinated from those conversations. Like, like every journalist I have, I try to make it a habit of checking in with, with people throughout the day just to find out what's happening. Um, Oftentimes, interesting stories flow from that. Um, but additionally, um, you know, we don't always set the news agenda. Sometimes things happen. Companies announce giant mergers, and then we have to respond and find a way to tell the story. Um, or we see other news accounts. I mean, this, this is a very uh, competitive space. Media is of interest to a lot of people, and it's also in a moment of transition, which has attracted heightened interest. Um, you know, so, so when a competitor breaks a story, um, simply rewriting someone else's work is not worthwhile. Uh, it doesn't, it isn't, re do it doesn't, isn't rewarded with traffic. Yeah. It doesn't really, you know, really enhance your credibility in any way, just basically hiving off of someone else's work. So you have to find a way to continue the conversation and advance the conversation. So it's, a, so my news reporting is a combination of, um, you know, ideas that are germinated either from conversations or a way to explore a trend in a way that's engaging or from stories that are breaking that you need to advance uh, that, you know, or in, in some cases, an editor will have an idea uh, that um, from his or her own experience that will guide your reporting. And the editor's ideas are always more important than yours. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, God, there's so many different things I can ask you, but I want to keep it as efficient as possible for you. So let's talk about students who are, first of all, the career that you've chosen and how it's evolved over time and just the way that, you know, your personal satisfaction of it. What is your advice to young people who are thinking about journalism? First of all, what is the, are, are the number of jobs, like paying jobs in journalism increasing or decreasing because the business of journalism has evolved so much and business models, how it how reporters are paid because of how subscriptions are, you know, all of the different money aspects of it. Um, what's your advice to young people who are thinking about it, about some of those like basic questions? Yeah, there, I mean, and, and in some ways, uh, people who are just entering the field of journalism are lucky because um, in the olden days, um, there was a, a real hierarchy, uh, you know, where graduates of a certain school had opportunities at publications of a certain certain size. And then there was a very distinct sort of career ladder. One would climb from one publication to a larger publication to a larger publication until you know sort of you, you need, reached your ceiling. Um, now the world is you know obviously a different place. So it's not nearly as uh, stratified. 
um, and there are many more options. So if I were to enter this field today, I would take advantage of the, all the storytelling tools that are available to me and experiment with them, whether it's medium, you know, to, to, to write some sort of long form analysis piece and put it out into the world, or perhaps Substack to create a newsletter if you're particularly passionate about a particular subject and believe you offer some expertise. This is a way to get paid in a way where you're not uh, actually, you don't have to go find an employer to subsidize your work. You can direct, directly benefit from your work. Um, to uh, you know, to uh, an array of digital publications that often are um, seeking out young younger journalists who are you know hungry and energetic and uh, comfortable with uh, with the with the tools the publishing tools that exist uh, for a lot of a generation ago as journalists uh, this this transition from you know word to uh, browser based publishing platforms was a transition that wasn't easy for everyone um, so. You know, so so there are many more options, and if 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 I were starting out, um, I would use all these publishing platforms to showcase either my writing or my uh, reporting. We use YouTube. Uh, if if you visual, you imagine yourself as a as a broadcast potential broadcast journalist or a visual storyteller, that too is a platform for reaching an audience and also to refine your skills. Or the world of podcasting, which is yet another avenue for 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 young journalists. To showcase their ability to tell stories and to elicit um, elicit comments from interview subjects, all of these will provide a strong and compelling portfolio when seeking, uh, you know, sort of a current, current you know, more uh, regular paying gig at one of the the established outlets. It'll, you know, you'll need to have some body of work to show a future employer should you, uh, you know, attempt to to go that route. Um, and these things will all be important. And and so there's no there are no barriers to entry. At this point, for aspiring journalists, you can you can publish, you can broadcast with the tools at your disposal, um, and that's a, it's a great way to attract the notice of editors. I know, uh, for instance, uh, Ryan Mack, a former colleague of mine at Forbes, who went on to BuzzFeed, has recently joined uh, the New York Times, and it's this combination of his work at BuzzFeed. He did some great investigative work of social media companies like Facebook, and also is like very sassy. Uh, Twitter presence that that really made put him at the center of conversation. He was uh, really critical. He was reading other people's work and sort of surfacing the good and the bad and the ugly, and and uh, and that that landed him at the largest newspaper in the country. So, you know, so so there are a lot of there are a lot of great options for people who are just starting out. Well, well, let's talk about that a little bit too. So it sounds like based on what you said, it's it's. Is this true? It's increasingly important for the journalist to become a brand, kind of a brand in and of themselves, so that you're following Don Chmielewski as much as you're following Forbes, as an example. Like, it, it, don't you think that's true? So you're you creating a persona and voice for yourself that people are seeking you out and not just the publication. That's that's increasingly true. I think it has been, um, you know, is is. Um, you know, the creator culture has flourished over the last several years and there, there are new ways for writers or creative people to get paid. It's ever more important to have a distinct voice and to be out on social media and to be recognizable and distinct. Um, and, and you have a way of being rewarded for, you know, for having a unique voice or interesting perspective, um, <clears throat> you know, and, 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 and standing out from the crowd. Well, okay. So like the example you used of the BuzzFeed journalist who went over New York Times. So you said that this person was quite provocative, right? In mm -hmm. their social media yeah. presence. So right. when they come over to the venerable New York Times where you are m more objective, more of a, a, you know, it, for lack of a better word, what happens to a journalist like them? Are they, uh, are they allowed to continue to be that, that personality on, uh, online like they were before, or do they have to adopt a new persona and control? You know, this is a, yeah, you're right. This is a real source of tension inside newsrooms. Uh, social media award, awards uh, attention seekers in a way. Mm -hmm. um, so the more provocative, the more attention you attract, the more you're rewarded by the platform. Uh, mm -hmm. Venerable news organizations like the Gray Lady are not so much about you being, you know, being uh, uh, perhaps provocative in an <coughs> way. So there's certain, there's certain parameters that exist around, um, I know the New York Times social media feed um, 
often and, and more broadly through all news organizations, it's really discouraged. Reporters are generally discouraged from commenting on offering opinionated an opinionated take on subjects that they they, they frequently cover um, that would suggest a bias. Yeah. And and that those policies will change by news organization. Um, you know, so so Forbes, uh, I, I tend um, tend to be a little bit more. <clears throat> A little bit less flip because I come from this um, respected business publication, so I tend not to be um, like vulgar, and I definitely don't chime in on politics. Although I might share some political things that I find interesting, but uh, us we're really discouraged from um, you know taking taking a perspective, being a partisan, or taking a particular viewpoint on an issue. This was uh, challenging during the Black Lives Matter, the, the height of the Black Lives Matter movement. There were some internal discussions about. You know whether journalists could 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 uh, could show their support, uh, and it was a source of a lot of tension in the newsroom. The, you know, the editors and the reporters had different views about uh, about that. Yeah, I would imagine. I mean, these are the increasing challenges uh, from a journalist perspective. And you mentioned that it's like one of the great things about the new platformization and the technology is that any young writer, any young journalist, has all these different an avenues. But because of that there's the volume of people who are doing this, the sheer numbers is massive. So Don, if somebody's out there is watching this and they're in journalism school, let's say, well, quick question, is journalism school still critical to become a, a successful journalist? I think that anyone who's a smart, you know, who's, who's thoughtful and, you know, can, can become a journalist. We've seen, I've seen people come from a variety of backgrounds, not necessarily having a journalism degree succeeding in this profession. But uh, having a having a journalism degree or going to Columbia getting a master's degree will shorten the uh, okay. shorten your travels to uh, to the upper echelon of, of the industry. Okay, um, but if, I don't think it's it's a requirement. But if you have all these people who are out there being podcasters or whatever, and they're trying to break through, how does a young person who has you know there are a lot of talented people out there, what do you tell them to do? Like, how do they first get noticed among them? tens of thousands, if not more, hundreds of thousands who are trying to do the same thing, even if they're all really talented. Yeah, so I think that this, this uh, is a moment when we can benefit from uh, what happened on YouTube in the early days. You, you, you know, YouTube is glutted with videos. And so the creators found a way to stand out was to do collaborations with more popular um, YouTubers. You know, so, so uh, and that, that that would help attract a larger audience to their, very own, their own YouTube podcast. So in the same way, um, journalists can look to build professional affiliations with people who are established in the industry, you know, starting with college professors who might be able to make introductions to, you know, simply emailing or, you know, contacting on social media platforms and making an introduction. I mean, it is still at bottom a relationship business. It is some combination of skills, you know, skills and abilities and, um, you know, contacts that help you help that help pave the way to a professional career. And hopefully the people who are watching this um, do have, you know, some, some small professional connections or a, professional, or a professor who can help them bridge that gap. Yeah, I mean, look, that's the thing. That's one of the themes with all my guests who are on Creative University is that relationships ultimately are the most critical thing because it will help you get your first kind of step even if it's mm -hmm. not the perfect step and you can leapfrog from there. Okay, so I'm gonna be very mindful. Um, I'm gonna ask you one last question. So when Thank you, you, Peter. You're a hero and who's your um, hero when it comes to journalism, like your icon of what you strive to be? If there uh, is. You, you know, there's so many people to learn from. I mean, uh, like there are amazing interviewers like Terry Gross or even Oprah Winfrey who gets people to, uh, uh, confide details about themselves that they might not otherwise. The uh, Harry and Meghan uh, interview that was watched by millions was really a master class in how journalists can conduct interviews. Um, I have many writers who I admire and you know hope to emulate. Uh, their you know friends at the New York Times or, or friends at, at the Journal. There's so much good writing in the world, uh, you know, and so. To improve as a personally as a writer, I know that I find you know I'm drawn to others who are also covering this same area and doing great work. So um, you know the Joe Flint's of the world, who I worked with at the LA Times, or the 
Ed Lee, uh, who I worked with at Recode and is now at the New York Times, are all great exemplars of, of um, you know, fabulous writers whose, whose work I'm slightly jealous of and hope to one day emulate. Okay, got, got you. Well, listen, it's great. And, and for everybody out there, um, it's, so, it's so critical to understand technology as well as the media and entertainment world as you may think of it to be because of all these things that we've alluded to and understand the different tools out there, but understanding how much technology has transformed the business. So if you want to learn all that and keep up to date, one of your great resources will be following Don. So follow Don Jumaleski. You have her name, you have how it's spelled <laughs> and it's more, even more complex than my last name, but follow her and read her and watch what she's doing because then you'll be in good stead and you'll be able to be up to date. So Don, I'm gonna let you go. I really appreciate it. Appreciate your time here. Um, you've always been somebody from a journalist perspective as somebody, I, because I like to write. Um, I, I've known you for a long time and I really respect what you've done and keep doing what you do. Can't wait to read your new book that will be coming out at some point fairly soon. Watching Early next year. Okay, Age next times. Year. It's, uh, it will uh, take a look at this uh, streaming revolution that we just, that we're living through in this very moment. So. Yeah, no, it's great. Oh, definitely will be a great read, but thank you so thank much. You so I'll much let you go. I'm gonna be looking for your headline story later on today. All right, take care, be well, Peter. Okay, good to see you. Thanks for your time. Yeah. No, thank you, Don. See ya.